Welcome to the show, my international people. This is a show about drugs, selling drugs, undercover, this and that. You better not be in the drug business. If you're in the drug business, this is not the show for you, okay? <laughs> My international people, welcome back to the UNI talk show, Wachu and International with your favorite host, Louise Wachu. Thank you for following the show. We're back in studio. I don't know where you are following our shows. We're back in studio and we're speaking to a great guest today. He's an undercover person, so you may not see his picture, his real picture. We'll show you a couple of pictures from him. But he is a great guest. He's written some fascinating stories. Mr. Robert Mazur is on the show today. Welcome to the show, Mr. Mazur. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate being invited. So, um, like I was, we were just talking a, a little bit before the show, and I was asking you how old you were. You're, you're a grown-up man. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a grown-up man now, that's for sure. Um, during the course of the undercover operation in the, uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, I, I was in my late 30s and uh, married and had uh, two children that were ages 9 and 11 uh, when I uh, accepted this long-term undercover assignment. You were already married and you had two children? Yes, that's right. Wow. Um, so how did your wife uh, take that when you said, um, we're married, I have two children, but I'm going undercover? Well, I'd been a federal agent for 14 years at that stage, and um, even just working cases in the traditional sense, um, families of law enforcement officers are uh, unfortunately used to living abnormal lives and, and not having the opportunity to have their loved ones at home as often as, as possibly people in other professions. Um, but yes, it's, a totally, it's, it's really a totally different experience when you accept a long-term undercover assignment and then um, actually live another life. And in this instance, the, uh, the, the, the story in the book is a story where I had my first real long-term assignment for two years undercover. And then after that, it was... Uh, Two years plus preparing for trials, and then uh, two years plus uh, actually testifying around the world. And then after that uh, experience, then I went back undercover for uh, another two and a half year assignment. So it's a very, very long, tedious process, and, and, it, and it does involve a lot of sacrifice by uh, the spouse uh, of the long term undercover and, and their families. Wow. Well, um, it was worth it because you wrote this book called The Infiltrator. And the book is really popular. And uh, I have a movie here, that movie, uh, Miami Vice. Um, right. Were you a consultant on that movie? I saw your name uh, on Miami Vice. Yeah, that's true. I, I was um, contacted by Universal Studios and asked to be a technical consultant on that movie because it really is a movie about uh, not just long-term undercover agents working within the drug world, um, but it also has quite a bit of information about um, money laundering within it. And so because of my expertise in those fields, uh, I was asked by Michael Mann, the director of uh, Miami Vice, to work closely with, uh, with him and with the uh, actors in the movie. Uh, the principal actors were... Uh, Colin Farrell, Jamie Foxx, and, and a fabulous uh, actress from China, actually the most popular of the, the uh, actresses uh, there, uh, Dung Lee. And, um, and so I had the opportunity to work closely with them, and, and it was uh, a very interesting process. And at the end of the process, Michael Mann asked uh, or said to me that he would like to do a movie about my life, but the first thing and, and the more difficult thing that I needed to do in order to get to uh, to that level was to write a book. And that was really the, the thing that spirited me on into the idea of writing the book. I, to 
to hear from someone as creative as Michael Mann to think that the story of my life working undercover uh, would be um, something that would be of that great of an interest. Um, that that seemed like uh, a well worth uh, endeavor after hearing that from him and I. And so I went through a process and took several years in order to get the book written. And, and I had the opportunity not just to be a part of that, I actually got to write the book myself because the, um, the literary agent that um, I engaged, as well as the publishing company, after looking at the preliminary work that I did on the book, thought that uh, I was capable of writing it myself. So I got the opportunity of, to really tell the story uh, myself from a personal perspective. Uh, I think that might have, some of that might have been lost in the translation if I had used a ghostwriter. It's very different when you write it yourself and if you tell the story to someone else and then they write it, right? Yeah, yes, uh, definitely. And, and um, the, 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 uh, the good thing about the book was that I, well, I, I did a, a uh, book proposal first. I didn't write the entire book. I just wrote what's called a book proposal, which is a one detailed chapter and summaries of all the other chapters and an overview of the book and a, a bio of the author and a marketing plan. And that's traditionally what um, authors prepare uh, to provide um, kind of a preview of what the book will be to publishers. And um, in, within four weeks of that being on the market, uh, my agent was contacted and uh, I wound up selling the book. But the, uh, the challenge was that they wanted the book finished in six months. And so I really had to completely immerse myself in that writing process, which really was probably a good thing because uh, it, it really does require your complete and total attention. I, I wrote from, uh, and I run a, an investigative agency as well. So I wrote from 7 in the morning until 10 uh, and then ran the company from 10 to 2, and then from 2 in the afternoon to 2 in the morning, uh, did my second session of writing for the day, and caught five hours sleep, and, and then started the process over again. So I did that for six months, uh, every single day, every holiday, every weekend, um, and was able to finish the book on schedule. Mm. Wow. So the book came after Miami Vice? For some reason, I was thinking that, um, you know, the Miami Vice came after the book. Maybe they read your book. Because the story in Miami Vice kind of looked, sounds like your story. Didn't they steal your story a little bit? No, I don't think they stole the story. But, uh, but I, I did get the opportunity to, to, I think, share some insight into what it's like to be working at that level within the underworld. And, and so, in a, in a sense, they used, certainly as a technical consultant, they used some of the ideas and the scenes. Uh, that I uh, that I suggested, but no, my book wasn't completed until um, a year or two after, well, a couple of years after uh, Miami Vice was done, and now we're working on a uh, movie development project based upon my book um, with uh, a, a very talented director by the name of Brad Furman, who his last very successful movie was uh, in 2011, that was The Lincoln Lawyer, and then just this past well, this month, um, a movie that he did um, called Runner Runner that I worked with him on with Ben Affleck and Justin Timberlake uh, came out. So he, he definitely works um, among the, uh, the well-known in the, in the movie industry, and we're hoping to get uh, this particular project into production, meaning shooting it uh, beginning in the fall of 2014, just a little bit less than a year from now. Wow, that's really, really great. But doesn't this put you in danger, though? Because you're undercover. And like right now, we're not showing your face. We're just showing a couple of images and your silhouette. So doesn't that put you in danger? Aren't the bad guys? How hard is it for the bad guys to find you when you do all these things? Well, at the end of the uh, undercover operation, that's the focus of my book there. And it's in the book that I had a... I was visited by representatives of two federal agencies and also informed by an intelligence agency that there was a contract on my life. And so my wife and I and two kids um, left the country, came back under another identity, and pretty much lived underground for quite a number of years uh, after that. And, you know, as far as threats are concerned, um, you know, one never knows. And 
so many of the people that I dealt with in the underworld um, have killed each other off. Uh, but there are certainly still some people that, that I dealt with back in, in, in the late 80s, early 1990s that are, that are still active in the underworld and, and or whose children are, you know, are active in the underworld. So I guess to a degree there's some risk that we take certain precautions that I think are, um, you know, give us the opportunity to be able to share the story. I had, I had an opportunity, my opportunity was this, either to not tell the story and to die with it, uh, or to take calculated risks and write the book so that the public could know the truth and, and, and then just manage that situation afterward. And, and my wife and I chose that uh, I would write the book and we would manage things after that. But you know, whether or not there is any real threat is something that uh, I, I, uh, I guess time will tell, but I would hope at this stage that, uh, that that's not the case. Wow. So we'll take a short break right now and we'll be back uh, in a second. We'll just take a short break. And when we come back, we will definitely get into the deeper, deeper aspect of your undercover work. Let's take a short break. My people will be back in a second. Welcome back, my international people. Louise Watch, who host of the You and I talk show, right now talking to Robert Mazou, author of The Infiltrator. Uh, he's a consultant. He worked on Miami Vice and other movies, and his book is going to get made into a movie. A great, brave man. So, um, your issue is that uh, one of the pitches that we received is that the police make millions by selling drugs. What, what's that about? I thought the police were stopping the drugs. Yeah, no, that was a really a current event issue that my publicist sent out. Uh, there was some publicity in the United States about uh, what's called a reverse sting uh, technique, which is very common in the United States. Um, clearly, it's not something that's done frequently in other parts of the world. But it's a situation where law enforcement uh, poses as drug suppliers instead of drug buyers and attracts good people, hopefully, uh, people who have a predisposition to be involved in the drug business and to buy uh, illegal drugs. And so, therefore, they're arrested when they arrive with large quantities of currency to purchase uh, large quantities of either cocaine, heroin, or methamphetamine or some other type of drug that, that uh, is readily available not just in the United States, but in, in just about every country. So in that instance there, um, I guess the, the, um, the complaint being made by the, the media, and, and really it's just conveyed uh, by defense attorneys uh, in, in Florida that were making the complaint, that they believe that some of the law enforcement agencies are very motivated to use this reverse technique and to make terms uh, offer terms to people that are so outrageously profitable that they induce people who might not otherwise be predisposed to be involved in drugs uh, to to actually get involved in the drug business and wind up getting arrested. You know, there are uh, there are times when, unfortunately, uh, especially using informants in these types of circumstances where. Um, there probably have been circumstances where there's been overreaching, where there's been um, uh, entrapment. Uh, but I think for the most part, uh, the law enforcement community manages the informants that they use in these techniques and, and avoid uh, prosecuting individuals who, or attempting to prosecute individuals who don't truly have a predisposition to do this. But in many countries, in, in Europe, that this would really be unheard of. The undercover technique itself is really not used quite uh, nearly as much uh, in in other parts of the world as it is in the United States. It's used very, very aggressively in the United States. 
I see. So the police would offer drugs at a much cheaper price, and then the person who's in the business or wanted to be in the business will be encouraged by that, and they'll fall into the trap. Well, that's, that's the argument that some defense attorneys make. The police really believe that they manage the informants well, but they, they do not go after people that there isn't a clear uh, record to show that they've previously been involved in this type of illegal activity, and so that they use uh, this sensitive technique in, in a judicious manner. And that's what I witnessed when I was involved in the law enforcement community. And, and I still uh, get exposed to that because in, in my investigative agency and consulting business, we work with defense attorneys um, on cases at times when uh, they have clients who have been um, charged with criminal offenses. And from what I can see um, in the many cases that, that we've worked on, um, law enforcement has judiciously uh, used this, this type of technique. It's just that there were quite a few articles that were written in the last week or so within the United States, uh, especially in Florida, in a town called Sunrise, Florida, where it was complained that in this little sleepy town, uh, there was a very aggressive police department that were luring people from all over the United States to come there with an expectation of buying drugs at a very favorable rate um, and wound up getting arrested. So um, that's really what resulted in, in uh, I guess, my publicist making the, the media aware that there was somebody who could speak to that issue and and, um, and, and so that's what brought that to the table. I see. Well, thank you very much for informing the public. So your particular book, The Infiltrator, My Secret Life, Inside the Dirty Banks Behind Pablo Escobar's Median Cartel, this happens in South America, right? How international, well, really how international is, this, is this movement, is this drug trafficking thing? How does it connect to Europe and Africa, for example? Sure. Well, first of all, it's a major, it's a major business. It's a major enterprise. It, it generates roughly $400 billion a year, every single year, from the sale of illegal drugs. Um, the, as far as cocaine is concerned, there are basically three source countries that provide the majority of it. That's Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. Um, the cocaine is most often uh, transported to two parts of the world. Um, for the North American routes that feed the insatiable appetite of the U.S. citizens, which is the most, uh, um, unfortunately, the citizenry that is most involved in the use of illegal drugs. Um, the, the first movement of the drugs goes to Mexico, and it's sold in a wholesale basis to the Mexican cartels that work closely with gangs in the United States that actually do the distribution. On the other hand, there are there is a, a totally separate route that runs from uh, Colombia, South America, runs through Venezuela, actually, because the Venezuelan government will not allow any uh, Western law enforcement presence there. So uh, Venezuela becomes the springboard from South America as a transshipment point to Africa. Uh, mostly the nations in West Africa, mostly French-speaking nations, uh, mostly nations that have a considerable presence of Hezbollah, uh, because there is a very, very clear relationship uh, between the Mexican cartel leadership, the Colombian cartel leadership, and um, individuals involved in Hezbollah that allow the m various countries in West Africa, like Guinea-Bissau, uh, Togo, Benin, um, uh, Benin, Mali, Ghana. Now, these are all nations that collectively act in the same fashion that Mexico does for the distribution of cocaine, except the uh, nations of West Africa or the transshipment point onto Europe, where there's a very, very active market there uh, for sale of not just the cocaine, but methamphetamine as well, uh, that, that flows out of uh, both Latin, just about all around Latin America, but in South America and in uh, Mexico and Central America. So there are two basic routes that create this $400 billion a year. And most of the transactions that occur uh, occur in U.S. dollars, because just like the legitimate markets of the world that rely on the U.S. dollar, the illegal markets do as well. If you want to go to uh, purchase huge quantities of appliances, let's say, normally speaking, you would go to a free zone in some part of the world. It might be the second largest free zone in the world, the one in Cologne, in Panama, 
uh, where you might make those purchases, legitimate pur purchases of goods. Um, and, in, and in those areas, uh, there are, um, it's readily accepted to receive currency in, in payment for those types of goods. And, it's, and it comes in dollars. Well, the same thing happens in the drug world. You may be conducting businesses in, uh, or cash or transactions in Africa, but the, the actual drug deal itself is paid for, the drugs are paid for with U.S. dollars. So the majority of this $400 billion a year is generated in U.S. dollars and moves through the U.S. banking system. Unfortunately, and this is part of the story that I tell in my book, uh, the U.S. government, which likes to profess that it's the most aggressive and successful in the seizure of, of drug assets, cannot uh, substantiate the seizure of more than, and, and, and I'm giving them every benefit of the doubt, roughly a billion dollars a year. Well, a billion compared to the $400 billion is one-fourth of one percent. Mm. And sometimes we wonder why and how these huge cartels operating out of Mexico, Colombia, and other parts of the world become as powerful and as corrupting of governments as they can, as they do. Uh, but that is because we really have very little effect on the revenue that's generated by these organizations through the sale of illegal drugs. They act uh, pretty freely around the world, um, and they unfortunately do influence the integrity of law enforcement, of the military, judicial and legislative systems. We can just look at Mexico as an example. More than 60,000 individuals who have lost their lives since 2006 when then-President Calderon of Mexico declared war, uh, a war on drugs in, in Mexico. We've had violence um, in that country and corruption in, in that country that has been um, at, at a greater degree than it has ever been uh, before. It was only last year that in town, in a small town called San Juan, Mexico, 49 bodies, headless, with their hands and their feet chopped off as well, were thrown at the entryway of that city, and in spray paint, Z 100% was written, Z for Los Zetas, that's the most violent of the Mexican drug cartels. That was a, uh, a threat that was made to the people of that region to let them know that, at least in the opinion of Los Zetas, they control the entire area, and in fact they do. Um, and, and those types of acts and that type of terrorism that's ongoing, that is affecting not just Mexico, but uh, those nations in West Africa and, and North Africa as well, um, is something, it's a rampage that's going on. And, and really, uh, the, the amount of control and the amount of violence and the amount of corruption that's being dished out by these organizations is very, very threatening to many democracies um, yeah. that, that are in, this, in, the, in the world. I was just going to ask you that. Um, how can how does this influence the political changes? We know that, for example, in those countries that you mentioned in in West Africa, uh, some of them are politically unstable. Do you think sometimes this coup d'état and political instability is also fueled by this international drug uh, traffic? Absolutely, no doubt. Your your listeners should Google um, uh, drug trafficking and Guinea Bissau. Uh, that little tiny country on the west coast of Africa um, is a prime example. Uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration did an operation just for three, or three or four months ago, uh, whereby they arrested uh, the former head of that country's Navy. They attempted to arrest the head of the military. Uh, there have been coups by the military in that country by the corrupt uh, military uh, leaders. Uh, that are there, who have been corrupted by the Colombian and Mexican cartels, and who allow their country to be used for the free passage of money and drugs uh, on behalf of the cartels. Um, so uh, just Google Guinea Bissau and uh, Colombian uh, traffickers or words that uh, relate to that money laundering, and, and you'll see the story about that unfortunate uh, events uh, of three or four months ago. Yeah, thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll be back in a few seconds. We'll take a short break and then go into our last segment. And then we'll talk about your pictures and some of the very fascinating things that you've already written about. 
We'll be back in a very short break, my international people. Thank you for being with us. Luis Uachu, you and I talk show from Vancouver. Welcome back, my international people. Thank you for being with us. The UNI talk show today, Robert Mazur, undercover people, undercover giving us information that you can't find anywhere else. The author of The Infiltrator. Soon coming to your screens, my international people. Robert Mazur, thank you so much for being with us. So let's talk a little bit about your real position when you were doing this. And then let's talk about this suitcase of money like why would you see all that money why were you ever tempted to take all that money and just bounce change your name leave off those millions you and your wife and kids never come back you know because you're living undercover now right well i never had that temptation whatsoever i mean i got into law enforcement for a reason and my reason was that i wanted to be a part of making a difference and my view about making a difference was always really to get as close in the trenches and as close to the highest levels of crime that I could possibly achieve. I didn't want to take promotions and wind up 15 levels above the street and, and be far away from it. I wanted to, to deal with it firsthand. Mm. And so when I had the opportunity to volunteer to be a long-term undercover agent and be trained as one, and then spent 18 months putting together what I think is one of the more sophisticated fronts that have ever been used, my role was to be a believable, uh, Italian-American corrupt businessman with ties to Italian-American organized crime and a person who was interested in expanding his involvement in money laundering to take, a, take advantage of the, the Latin American markets. And so with the help of some informants and, and a plan that took about 18 months to put together, I created a completely new identity. I was embedded in real businesses, an investment company, a mortgage brokerage business, at an air charter service for the private jet. Uh, we have a picture of you with a private jet. We also have, um, is that a, is, was that your private jet? Were you telling people that that's your jet? Yeah, it was, it was actually titled in the name of my investment company and it was uh, on paper financed by my mortgage business and, and chartered by the air charter service that we ran from uh, Florida to the Bahamas. So we had that. We also had a jewelry chain with 70 locations on the East Coast and even a brokerage firm with a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. So I didn't really have to be the very best undercover agent. I think I was blessed with uh, leadership that gave me the opportunity to really meticulously put this together so that I could have a very solid front. I didn't carry a gun or a badge when I worked undercover. My total uh, protection was the believability um, um, and the bona fides of my undercover life and you and also so, had a rolls royce that's a very nice rolls royce how do you go <laughs> yeah i won't ask you which car you're driving now but how do you go from a rolls royce to like uh, another regular car after this and how do you yeah, get no. the rolls royce is is this something that the government arranges for you like mm -hmm. no you know and one of the things that i think is important and i explain this in the book is that uh, there are no taxpayer dollars used to finance this operation under the law, we are allowed in the United States, uh, under what's called an attorney general's exemption, to use the profits from the undercover operation to defray the cost of the undercover operation. And so, yes, I made millions of dollars um, while I laundered tens of millions of dollars uh, for the Medellin cartel. But that money that was made from that was used to really arrange the demise of the people that I dealt with. I ultimately became a conduit for them dealing with what was the seventh largest privately held bank in the world, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. And BCCI and its senior bank managers who I dealt with, uh, BCCI had an insatiable appetite to take in deposits from illicit sources. That's how they became so very prominent in the financial international banking community um, was to make their services available to the underworld. Unfortunately, I've since found um, not just through that case, but through others that I worked, 
but that's not really a very um, unique technique. It's unfortunately something that uh, many international banks have resorted to. And we can see that even in today's news. I mean, just this past year, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation, HSBC, admitted to the fact that they were involved in committing a criminal offense in connection with the services they provided to many different types of individuals involved in illegal activity. They admitted that they had moved at least $881 million for the Sinaloa cartel, which is the largest one in Mexico, and the Norte de Valle cartel, which is the largest in Colombia. They admit to the fact that they helped and counseled people on how to uh, alter records and to uh, transform the appearance of, re uh, of transactions so that they could allow people to deal with Iran during the time frame that the sanctions had been in place so that the Iranian economy could continue to flourish. They admitted many other types of criminal offenses, and they, none, of the, none of the bank officers that were involved in that ever went to jail. They paid, uh, the bank paid a $1.92 billion fine and forfeitures, um, but they, they basically bought their freedom. And $1.9 billion sounds like a lot of money, but that only constituted one-tenth of the net profits before taxes of HSBC in one year, in Ooh. 2010. Wow. So, I mean, that's really more of paying a fine for the right to be able to deal uh, with the underworld. And this is something that unfortunately happens um, in more banks than we'd like to know. There have been roughly a dozen banks um, in the United States uh, that have, you know, they're not all U.S. banks. Some of them are banks in other parts of the world, but they have all entered into uh, agreements admitting to criminal conduct uh, for handling money uh, related to illegal activities. And then the list is long, and the list involves many prominent banks. There's one from Canada, actually, the uh, Lebanese Canadian Bank, uh, that admitted to being involved in uh, the laundering of drug proceeds that were generated in, in combination by the Mexican and Colombian cartels with Hezbollah. Mm. So, uh, And that's a case that your listeners can... Um, Google and see information about how you can either do it by uh, Googling the Lebanese Canadian Bank or you can, uh, there's one lead defendant, the last name is Juma, J-O-U-M-A-A. -A. So just you know, Google Juma and drug trafficking and you'll see that story um, about the many hundreds of millions of dollars uh, generated uh, and laundered uh, in, that that, in that particular case. Wow, isn't that um, discouraging to someone, an idealist, because I'm going to call you an idealist, like you, who do all this job and then the government, your government, the same government that you're working for, kind of let game, it lets them get away with it. And doesn't that make uh, your government uh, sort of an accomplice into this whole thing because if the government just accepts to get like a share it's as if the government is getting a cut and then they let the bankers and the drug dealers get away with it what's what's that how do you feel about that well i think it's terrible i think that uh, there's a very small number of people uh, within the united states um, in the uh, of our elected officials who share the same disdain for that as i do and, and one of the people, and, and she's my hero, um, Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts. Um, another thing very interesting I think that your listeners would, would find is to Google Elizabeth Warren, uh, HSBC, and YouTube. There are some YouTube videos of her really uh, asking very difficult questions of the bank regulators and the leaders of the law enforcement agencies in the United States. Um, what the types of questions that she asks them uh, that they can't answer are things such as, tell me the last time you've taken the biggest banks on Wall Street all the way to trial. None of them could answer that because they haven't. And, in your, and, and another thing she asked them is, in your opinion, how many billions of dollars do you have to launder for drug lords before somebody says we're shutting you down? Her argument was, why wasn't HSBC's license to bank in the United States affected by this. Um, and, and, and I think another thing uh, that, that she made very, very clear um, and, and is a very, very true statement is that um, if an individual is caught with cocaine, 
Exactly. They're likely going to go to jail. And exactly. Several times, they may go to jail for the better part of the rest of their life. But if you're caught laundering hundreds of millions of dollars, you get to go home and sleep in your own bed. And that doesn't make any sense. And so that's part of why I'm on your show. That's part of why I wrote this book. That's part of why I will never stop telling this story. And it's part of why I want to share this with honest citizens around the world who can do something about this. First, they need to be armed with information. They need to know what the true facts are about this. And secondly, what they can do is share this truth with other people and with those people who should be elected as officials, and they can, they can have an impact uh, when they go to the polls and, and they vote. Uh, and they can be very mindful of who it is that takes an awareness to this and is not, um, does not follow a course of action that's, that would suggest that they might be puppets of uh, the banking lobbies around the world. So uh, this is an important story. It's an important story because, you know, if these cartels are not put in check, if they continue to grow in their revenue, if they continue to be able to turn the mountains of currency into legitimate appearing businesses, their ability to corrupt our government is made so much easier. And it's not just the drugs that are on the street that are affected. It's the effectiveness of truthful government that gets affected. And it's an important issue that we all need to be as informed about as we possibly can. Yes. We love you, Robert Mazur. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's so short, unfortunately. We're out of time. But we really, really love your message and everything. We're here to inform and educate people. Do you have uh, something that you want to say before uh, we let you go? We have one minute to go. Sure. Well, you know, I would appreciate it greatly if you would uh, link us to... Uh, there's a website for my book and the movie and this message. And it, it is uh, www.v-infiltrator.com. That's v-infiltrator.com. And your listeners can get all types of information about these topics um, and, uh, and, and the book and the movie and, and where that, the, those, those projects are headed. Thank you so much, Robert Mazur. And please keep going, keep finding out, and keep teaching. We're looking forward uh, to your movie. We're, we're, we're looking forward to your next book. Really, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, Mr. Mazur. And stay safe. Don't let them bad guys, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm scared of doing an interview with you because I'm always like, well, what if, you know, this and that, and, you know. Uh, you're, you're safe. Don't worry. No okay, problem. great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have a great day, and we hope to have you again on the show eventually when your movie comes out, and we'll definitely keep watching your work and make sure that we, we are informed because you got some great information for everyone. All right, thank you. Good night. My international everybody, that's it. That was Robert Mazur. He was so great. Oh, wow. Go get legal.